seven key concepts that really go into the budget process that we rely upon, and, and they're outlined again in our basic law of budgeting and encourage you to think about uh, even just picking up a copy. You can get it from our online bookstore. So there's appropriations. You have to have an appropriation. Uh, gross basis budgeting is another concept that we think is very important. The bottom line amount that's proposed for a particular expenditure or the bottom line amount that's proposed for the, for the budget as a whole. Warrant notice, which goes to the issue of uh, is the voter reasonably apprised of the fact that a certain item is going to be discussed and do they want to spend the time to come to town meeting, either deliberative session or voting session to vote for or against a particular situ situation, uh, such as say a new public safety uh, complex that there's no spending without an appropriation, lapse of appropriation, transfer of appropriation, the 10% limitation. The last three really are key. You know, you can't spend without an appropriation. Appropriations generally lapse for the end, at the end of the fiscal year, and transfer is an authority that the select board has as the governing body. So appropriation, uh, uh, concept number one, appropriation. What is an appropriation? The legislative body makes a policy decision to spend a specific amount of money for a specific purpose. Now this is usually clear to the public body when you're dealing with a special or separate warrant article, but it's the same concept when it's embedded in a line item in your budget. Yeah, and you have these forms that DRA uses. I'm, I am assuming you're all generally aware of the fact that the whole tax rate setting process has been moved into an electronic database, which is maintained by DRA. Your finance administrator is is, is feeding mm -hmm. data, and, and it from it's from that tax rate setting process. The forms and documents that are documenting how you do the process and the public hearings, that's all fed to DRA. They actually will produce for you a, a warrant uh, from a standard language that they have, and then that will be used to then, with the final ruling by the town meeting to help set the tax rate. Um, so an appropriation is authorization to spend money, not the actual spending itself, that we're going to raise and appropriate X dollars, uh, $100,000 to fix the fire ladder truck or to buy a new fire ladder truck, as the case may be. Um, uh, appropriations is to indicates to raise is to identify the source of the funds. So you're going to say, I'm going to raise and appropriate X dollars by general taxation, or I'm going to raise and appropriate 100000 from the capital reserve fund, or I'm going to spend it from a special revenue fund. Um, appropriate means I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to, as part of the Warren article, I'm going to take $100,000 out of the public works capital improvement fund to build that intersection that was decided to be improved as part of a Warren article. The purpose uh, is the goal or the aim to be accomplished through the expenditure of funds. The $100,000 is going to go towards putting in that XL and D-cell lane for that particular uh, intersection that needs to be improved. Um, and and the, the, the concepts of these appropriations is not limited to just things set forth in the DRA forms. The DRA form is the one that it, uh, Hanson is probably using is the MS-636. The MS-737 is the form that the, the, the overall budget forms that DRA uses for schools is, uh, is 737, towns is 636. Uh, but then you can also have other appropriations that would not necessarily fall into one of those categories, such as uh, it was common in my town, and we'll get to this in a second, uh, that, that our town meeting would raise an appropriate sum every year to help support the work of the visiting nurses in the town. And so that's, you'll never see an appropriation for visiting nurses on the DRA budget form, but it certainly would be an, an appropriate public purpose. Um, and that's what we're going to speak of right now, proper public purpose. All appropriations have to be for a proper public purpose. Um, and it's any purpose not prohibited by New Hampshire Constitution or by any other law. School districts have it limited to the support of public schools and village districts purposes for which the village district is um, created. So what is a proper public purpose? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing as public benefit. The general benefit of the public still might not count. There has to be some implied authority to appropriate it for that particular purpose. Now, generally, what we suggest is you keep in mind that um, as long as there's incidental private benefit, it doesn't necessarily mean that the proposed appropriation is illegal. So if I'm raising and appropriating $10,000 or $5,000 or even 
five hundred dollars to help support the work of the cap of the uh, visiting nurse association in the town of Hampton. I'm clearly going to help benefit individual clients, but it's certainly true that that's giving general public public benefit to the town as a whole. Because what it may do, it may support people in the community and help them avoid coming to you through local welfare assistance or other forms of assistance. And they'll keep them in their homes longer or maybe allow them to work longer. So there has to be a sufficient public benefit from a public uh, appropriation. But I think everyone would agree you're raising an appropriate money for a fire truck or to build a road. There's no doubt that's a public purpose. But certainly you should not be spending money plowing private roads or driveways. And in fact, uh, there's a statute, and I believe it's RC 231 pulling 59, but it's close that says towns are authorized to spend money raised from taxation for class four and class five roads only. Right. And that's in cl making clear that you could have a class six road, still a town road, but you're not uh, authorized to spend public dollars on the maintenance of such a class six road. Okay. So uh, with appropriations, how specific should the Warren article be? You know, I think generally the voters should be setting uh, broad policy outlines, but leave the governing body some <laughs> flexibility as to details. If you get too specific, and we've seen this in Warren articles before, to see if the town will raise and appropriate $50,000 <coughs> to buy the, uh, the 2010 Chevy Ford pickup truck, blue in color, which is sitting on the lot at the <laughs> Grapponi Auto Dealership. It is so specific that if it's not there, you may have a difficulty of complying with the duty to spend the money only for the approved purpose. Um, and always, as we, we encourage you, you've got to, at some point in the Warren article state the, the actual amount, the specific amount that's appropriated for that purpose. And, and here's an area that happens all the time, and I'll mention it here. Oftentimes, uh, we'll get a Warren article after the fact um, that the Warren article said the see if the town will raise and appropriate $100,000 to buy a new backhoe uh, and, and to take uh, 50000 uh, and to, to, to uh, uh, take $50,000 out of the, the capital improvement fund uh, for that purpose and to uh, raise the rest of the money by taxation. But then uh, they decide they find another backhoe that they can spend more money on and it's a better deal, let's say, and so they think, okay, let's trade in the one we have, and we'll get trade-in value. The problem is now they're about to sell a piece of town equipment, because that's what a trade-in is, and they didn't appropriate the dollars from that sale. So it's an area one has to be really careful with. If you're going to, in any transaction, uh, in a Warren article, do a trade-in or sell a piece of town equipment, say that in the article, and to raise and appropriate a sum not to exceed $20,000 from the potential sale of the existing backhoe. Um, with appropriations, there are content-based requirements that have to be for a public purpose, um, and uh, you have to have a gross amount appropriated, but there's also procedural requirements. You have to have a public hearing on your budget. Without a public hearing on the budget, you, you would probably not have a budget or unless you, you would use a, another statute where a town meeting can uh, correct the deficiencies in um, the adoption of a budget through a second town meeting that uh, corrects procedural deficiencies. You have to disclose all purposes and amounts of appropriation at the public hearing and certainly at the deliberative session. You have to have gross-based budgeting. You have to say the total amount that's raised and appropriated for an individual article or in the budget as a whole. You have to have recommendations. There are, there are certain requirements, certainly for a budget committee, if you have a separate special warrant article, such as a bond article, or to put money, um, uh, I'm trying to think of all the, the possible ones. Uh, put money into a capital reserve put, put fund. Put money into a capital reserve fund. Warrant a article. petitioned warrant article. These would be special, separate warrant articles where the budget committee is required to have a recommendation on it. You also have warrant notice that when the warrant is posted, you explain to the voters through the posting of the warrant, this is what we're proposing for the adoption of our budget. Uh, and you have to list appropriations on the posted budget, but that's in the forms, which I think nowadays, because of the way the computerized system operates, that's going to happen one way or another. Um, the budget committee 
has to have its first hearing at least 25 days before a traditional town meeting or on or before it's the third Tuesday in January. Mm -hmm. So this is RSA chapter colon 13. Um, so 4013 specifies the timetable for actions by uh, budget committee and SB2 town. It has to be held by the official budget committee and has to be at least seven days notice before that public hearing uh, for it to be a valid public hearing. Mm -hmm. All purposes of appropriation must be discussed or disclosed at the public hearing. So if the budget committee receives a last minute request from the select board at the public hearing, as long as it's discussed and disclosed at that public hearing, that can be a legal appropriation. Um, uh, Budget committee and the governing body cannot take can take the suggestions, or they can say no, we're not going to take up that proposal. But you can get new purposes and additional amounts may be brought at brought up at the public hearing. After the close of the public hearing, no new purpose or amount can be added by the budget committee or the governing body without another hearing. Now that theoretically could occur if you had enough time before your deliberative session to squeeze in another public hearing, and I've seen towns do it. Uh, at the last second, if you have enough time before your deliberative session, depending upon when your deliberative session is scheduled, because you've got that floating date, first Saturday in January, second, whatever it is, uh, you might be able to squeeze in the time for the seven-day notice for public, a public hearing. You can't have any increased amounts or no two subject, new subject matter. So important to emphasize, once the public hearing is closed and you're not holding another public hearing, you can't add increased amounts to the budget and you can't add new subject matter. It's fixed, set. Um, appropriations um, that you have uh, uh, for the budget also apply to petition warrant article. That is public hearings applied to petition warrant article. So if there's a petition warrant article to raise an appropriate public dollars, that has to have a public hearing. Um, you can have at least one hearing after the petition deadline. Schedule at least one hearing after the petition article deadline. So there's a petition article deadline in the statute, which I believe is in an SB2 town. It's the first mm -hmm. or second Monday in January. And so it's probably a good idea, and again, you can look at our calendars to try to schedule your public hearing, not necessarily in the last day, but at least uh, with enough time so that you know that all the possible petition warrant articles have been received, that you hold it after the deadline for the petition warrant article period has gone by. Um, and the, the budget committee uh, holds, finalizes the budget after the close of the public hearing and at the public meeting. Um, in SB2 towns, uh, in uh, such, such as Hampton, if you received, if the town received a petition warrant article that raises money by bonded indebtedness of more than $100,000, mm -hmm. there's a different deadline for the petition to be submitted. And that requires that it be submitted no later than the Friday before the second Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Again, you're probably going to find it easier if you have a concern about meeting your deadlines. Just check our calendars. We're going to be spending a lot of long hours in July getting those ready, and we'll produce them and get them available on our website and mail to you during September. Um, the ultimate uh, hearing deadline for a budget is 14 days before the town meeting. However, um, for a, a town like uh, Hampton, there's a set time period for having the budget posted. So what in my town, when I did my budget, we actually had the school district moderator, excuse me, the superintendent would walk up to us when we concluded the school budget hearing and he would ask us to sign the budget warrant. He wanted it signed because he was going to post it the day or two later. Same thing we would do at the, at the select board. They would walk up, the finance director would walk up and say, like, put your signature on the budget form. Uh, but in SB2 town, like Hampton, you have to post the budget on or before the last Monday in January. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, you know, the time frame. You've got to get things done and ready to be presented to the voters at the deliberative session. For appropriations and the posting of the warrant, it's traditionally 14 days before the meeting. It has to include all appropriations. If you don't have the appropriations listed in your budget or on a separate warrant article, uh, the DRA will invalidate any appropriations that are not appropriately listed. Again, this is where DRA will intervene and say, wait a minute, you missed a step. You didn't have a proper notice of that proposed appropriation which you think you now have adopted. Um, a couple of things and examples that I think are worthy of note for, on the subject of gross-based budgeting. Uh, so the first one is a warrant article to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate $25,000 to replace the wooden play structure at the town playground. The total replacement cost is $35,000. 
the 5,000 will be withdrawn from the Playground Capital Reserve Fund, and the selectmen have received a commitment for a donation for the remaining $5,000. So the, the immediate problem is mm -hmm. it did not say to raise an appropriate $35,000. Right. That's the gross amount. Certainly you could have the um, dollars coming from the Cape Playground Capital Reserve Fund, and you could even say, and to include any uh, donation not to exceed $5,000. Um, so as we suggest, you could change it to say to raise an appropriate $35,000 for the play structure. Of this, $5,000 is authorized to be withdrawn from the Capital Reserve Fund, $5,000 is anticipated from private donation, and $25,000 is raised by taxation. You have all the actual funds the dollars are coming from, and you have the total appropriation. That's what we mean by gross base budgeting. Um, another example, to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate <coughs> amount necessary to buy the 2015 Ford F3350 4x4 dump truck, and I have no idea what that is, Assembly <laughs> Ford sales in, in Fordham, New Hampshire. Um, and so the biggest problem is the failure to appropriate a sum certain, um, because we don't know what they need for the appropriation. But also, it's a very specific, designated, exact model, which if that model is not there and available, you're not going to be able to make this appropriation. So clearly the solution is to have a gross appropriation, and really don't use this very specific limitate, limiting language that limits the, the select board to a particular item. <laughs> Uh, a couple other examples to see if the town would vote to create the position of athletic director to coordinate the activities of youth athletic leagues. This is a part-time voluntary position. Uh, and then there's an amendment at the town meeting to uh, raise an appropriate $20,000 for the salary. So the immediate problem is the war original Warren article didn't have an appropriation, so it wasn't subject of a public hearing, and there was no notice of that proposed appropriation. So adding the $20,000 at the floor at the deliberative session is problematic. It'll probably be disallowed. The original article was probably fine um, if it was going to be a voluntary position, but if you add in the salary, it's going to be problematic, and it would, would make it difficult. They could have just left it alone and uh, allowed the select board to try to encourage someone out in the world who's willing to spend their time doing it. Um, if they wanted to fund the position, uh, they could have perhaps amend the operating budget to add $20,000 to the bottom line, but that doesn't mean the select board is required to spend those dollars. It would just be kind of moral suasion to encourage the select board to uh, have this person whose voluntary uh, proposal could be turned into a paying position. Um, so I think I am at, no, I continue. You have a lot more to go, Steve. Okay. <laughs> so gross base budgeting, we've already talked about special warrant articles. We've got special warrant articles which are petitioned appropriations, bond issues, coming dollars in or out of capital reserve funds or trust funds, designated special or non-lapsing or non-transferable. All of these kinds of warrant articles are ones where the budget committee does have to give a recommendation, yes or no. Uh, and in some towns, you've actually perhaps voted to indicate how the vote went. You know, mm -hmm. vote of six in favor, four opposed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, uh, recommendations are optional, as I mentioned, for a numeric tally. You can be required to have a numeric tally. It, again, it, it is uh, for se special and separate warrant articles. And as indicated, typically you'll have the budget committee saying they're going to recommend the article for a vote of 9 to 2, or the yeah. select board does not recommend the article by 3 to 2. Um, already mentioned that the official budget committee is an, uh, an action taken by the town meeting under RSA 3214. Uh, advisory committees are allowed, uh, <coughs> but since you don't have an advisory committee, you probably don't need to spend a lot of time on that issue. Now, the duties of the Budget Committee are review the current year's expenditures, review, review proposals of the governing body in terms of expenditures, prepare the budget, schedule and hold the budget hearings, and forward the final proposed budget of the governing body for posting at the warrant. Mm -hmm. It's the Budget Committee's budget. Yes. In terms of budget preparation, it is also the, the law that all municipal officers, administrative officials, uh, department heads, uh, prepare statements of estimated expenditures, and uh, they are also statement of revenues for the ensuing year. Uh, that is part of what all the officials should be doing. And these have to be submitted in such times and such details the governing body may require. In my town, the way it worked, and everyone's a little different, 
um, the, the town manager, we have a town manager for government just like uh, Hampton has. The town manager would have the department heads assemble his, their budgets and they would submit them to the town manager. The town manager would take a pass at them, usually cut them back by 5 to 10 percent, <laughs> and he would eventually present it to the select board. The select board would then cut it back another 5 to 10 percent and eventually be handed to us. Um, in that process, what we developed, I don't know how you do it here, but we developed a process in, where I live in the town of Bow that the town select board, before they would hand the budget to us, they would have two day-long hearings with all the departments. Each department head would come into the select board and say, here's our pitch for our budget. And really it allowed the department heads to say, yes, we know what the town manager has proposed, but this is what we really want. Mm -hmm. And then the select board can either go along with the town manager or listen to the department heads and say, yes, we're going to modify our proposal. Um, and so that's just one way that you can get the information perhaps you want to have in terms of making your judgments about appropriate amounts for uh, that particular department. Um, now, there is uh, department heads and other officers uh, have also have an obligation to, to mit, submit their departmental statements uh, and expenditures and receipts to the Budget Committee if requested. That's RSA Chapter 32, colon 16. Um, so there is a mechanism where the Budget Committee can ask for this information. But I think you're, you're, you probably have a little bit different situation uh, when you're dealing with a, a town that has a town manager form of government. Because when you have a town manager form of government, um, rather than the select board sitting on top of all these departments, and it's a little bit unwieldy for the departments to decide how they submit their information to the select board, and especially if there's a budget committee asking for information, you might be getting the departments asking for information to be submitted directly to the budget committee or to the, or to the select board. However, when you have a town manager, clearly under RSA 37, the town manager is the, the chief of all the departments. So in terms of this process where the budget committee has a need for information for a particular department, I think it's probably wise with a town manager form of government respect the hierarchy because all the people who work under the town manager are hired and fired by the town manager. So they have some degree of responsibility to file, to follow the, the, uh, the lines of authority. They, the information flows up to the department heads, goes to the town manager, and then uh, that would be something which could be, as I've suggested here, a conduit trans transmitting information to the budget committee. Now, certainly it's true that um, a budget committee might be involved in evaluating the expenditure side of a town's budget. So currently, right now, that's the process you typically would be in, because you don't really get into the process of building a budget until after it's put together by the town manager and the select board proposes it to you. In my town, typically that would happen sometime in October, November, and then we'd start budget hearings in December and complete them by the end of January, certainly for an SB2 town. Um, so I, in terms of now, you've got this period of time from you know May until probably September when the budget process really gets started. Certainly, it makes sense for a budget committee to be looking at, well, what's, what's the expenditure side of the operations? Mm -hmm. What's going on? And you may have a need to collect information, but I think in terms of your situation with a town manager, it should probably be go through the conduit of the town manager, you have a budget information request. I think that should always come from the budget committee as a whole, not individuals who have a particular interest in something. It should flow through to the town manager and come back to the budget committee. So you can monitor what you think is going on in terms of the expenditure side. So um, I think at this stage, Mark we need a break. <laughs> will take over and deal with budget transfer information. Yeah. So, so now we're moving on to the sort of expenditure side. And as I'm sure you know, the selectmen, they are the body in town that has the ability to expend funds. So the budget committee proposes a budget. The legislative body ultimately adopts the budget as amended, if, if at all, by the legislative body. And then the expenditure authority rests with the select board. And what 32 section 10 says, and that's the statute that's cited there for you on your slide, is that the governing body may transfer to an appropriation an unexpended balance remaining in some other appropriation. So the idea here is that 
You have a bottom line budget. Yes, it was made up of a lot of different line items for different reasons with different amounts. But at the end of the day, you added it all up to one big bottom line figure. And that is what the legislative body adopted, a bottom line budget. And so the selectmen, as the <coughs> entity, as the body in town that holds the purse strings, they have the ability to spend that money within that budget, which includes transferring some money from one purpose to another. We appropriated X for this uh, department, but we actually don't need that much. We need some of that over in Y department, and they <coughs> have the ability to transfer those funds to meet the needs of the town as the year goes on, because we budget, but then different you know, changes can lead to expenditures for slightly different purposes. Really important, and this is incumbent upon the governing body, the selectmen, is that they keep records of their transfers, <laughs> both the public and the budget committee needs to be able to see what transfers are going on and why because this goes back to what Steve was saying about monitoring expenditures throughout the year if you are the entity in town that has the role of putting together a proposed budget you know your job is to educate the voters and, and put out a budget that represents the needs of the municipality so if the budgeting is so off balance that there's constantly a need to transfer from one place to another that informs you in your putting together of the budget for the next Next year based on how the expenditures have gone throughout the previous fiscal year. Of course, nobody has the ability to dispute the selectman's authority to transfer. So even if you are looking at the records and seeing what the transfer is and, and you're considering that as you put together the next year's budget, the budget committee is not an expenditure body and they don't have the ability to stop the transfer of money and neither does the legislative body. They can't vote um, to you know restrict transfer authority among line items in the operating budget. Um, the limits on appropriations, Steve has already mentioned the 10% rule. So, of course, any uh, municipality with an official budget committee like Hampton has that ceiling. The legislative body has a ceiling on it. So they can't, as they're making amendments to the budget, they can't um, ultimately adopt more than 10% more of the total recommended budget of the budget committee. And what you see here in the second bullet is that the 10%, for the purposes of the 10%, you add up everything. So that's the operating budget and all of those separate warrant articles that contain money appropriations. But there are a few things that get taken out of that calculation. Fixed charges, bonds, interest and principal on payments, notes except tax anticipation notes, interest and principal payments on them, mandatory assessment imposed um, by towns on towns. So there are a few things that don't get calculated in, but typically what you're looking at is the whole picture and not just the adopted operating budget for the purposes of the 10% rule. Um, the ballot or or on the on the warrant, which is of course what you have before your deliberative session, the selectmen have the duty to put the warrant together and put it out to the voters within the time frame and that warns the voters this is what we're acting on, this is what we're discussing and deliberate, deliberating at the deliberative session. Um, that's their role to put together um, the warrant and then of course um, the ballot is put together after the deliberative session because it has to reflect any amendments made to warrant articles that were contained on the warrant. The ballot needs to contain, and same thing with the warrant, needs to contain just what the law says it's supposed to. So that's the, the questions that are being put to the legislative body, any recommendations required by law, um, any estimated tax impact, which you'll see up here on the screen, but nothing else. So the warrant, the ballot, that is not a place for explanatory information about why certain appropriations are being proposed, certainly not a place for any kind of advocacy language or things of that nature. Voter guides can accomplish uh, educating voters about why certain expenditures are being um, proposed, but that's not for the warrant and it's not for the ballot. Um, the estimated tax impact, something that the legislative body adopts and says, yes, we want. Um, we want that to be on our warrant articles. It's put on the operating budget and any special articles with a tax impact as determined by the selectmen. And then ultimately the tax impact is subject to their approval. So, so they're the ones who approve that yes, this is um, the appropriate tax impact. Warrant notice. 
So Steve mentioned at the beginning that the way we like to break out our budgeting concepts is into the seven key concepts. So we would now be on number three. If you were looking in our basic law of budgeting book, this would be concept number three. And I think Steve has already touched upon a lot of this, but the idea here is that an appropriation is only valid if the subject matter appears in the warrant. You are warning voters. This is what we are acting upon. So it has to be in the warrant that is required by 32 section six and new purposes or new line items cannot be added from the floor of the meeting because they were not warned. Doesn't prevent amendments to warrant articles that are on the warrant, but it prevents new things that were not warned on the warrant prior to the deliberative session. Um, notice and amendments. You are an SB2 municipality, so you have heard perhaps that um, there are restrictions on the extent to which the legislative body can amend warrant articles. Um, we're going to get to that in a second, but let's just sort of the basic points here is that um, at the deliberative session, the voters can amend warrant articles from the floor. So in SB2, you're not ultimately voting to adopt articles, but you are discussing mm -hmm. and you are amending and you are finalizing the language for the ballot. That is the purpose of the deliberative session. You have, you know, voters have the ability, of course, they're going to discuss and deliberate the separate warrant articles. Each one is going to be taken up for discussion. Um, when it comes to the operating budget, of course, that shows up on the warrant as an article that reflects the bottom line budget. But of course, posted is also the DRA budget form, which breaks out that bottom line budget further into the DRA line item appropriation purposes. So voters do have the ability to take the budget so-called line by line. Um, this is perhaps effective if obviously if this is what the voters want to do if they're the legislative body they control um, to a certain extent their deliberative session but keep in mind that even if the voters took the budget line by line they wanted to vote on each line item in the DRA budget an amendment to a single line item say they wanted to decrease one line item by twenty thousand dollars I think that you all know that that would actually be an amendment to the bottom line budget right. and it wouldn't be an amendment to that particular line item. You would still have a bottom line figure. It would now be decreased by $20,000. The selectmen retain the authority to transfer between line items in the budget anyway, so they could try to make up the difference in the cut in the bottom line budget. As you know, you're the budget committee. It's your proposed budget that goes to the voters, but it is just that. It's a proposed budget, and they're the ones who adopt it and potentially make amendments to it um, before it goes on the ballot and before it is ultimately voted on, um, subject, of course, to the 10% rule. So notice and um, amendments, sort of a few more words on this. Um, one of the things that can happen with amendments is that you can, that the voters can make changes that may sort of run afoul of the requirement for mm -hmm. warrant notice. So, you know, doing things like altering the mode of funding. So let's say you have uh, the Ford uh, F-350 truck and the way that it's set out in um, the warrant article um, is certain funding sources, but the voters want to make an amendment to change the funding sources slightly. That's usually okay. Okay, but keep in mind that if it changes it significantly, you could have a failure to change because the warrant article subject matter has been changed so significantly. So an appropriation to a capital reserve fund um, would be something that would need to be warned and couldn't come out as an amendment on the floor of the deliberative session for the first time. Another example might be an amendment to add a agents to expend to a capital reserve fund. So let's say there's an article on the warrant to establish a capital reserve fund, but the way that the article appeared on the warrant, it did not say anything about agents to expend. If the voters tried to add agents to expend to the article on the floor of the deliberative session, that would be invalid because it wasn't warned. And that really is a very substantial change because when you have a capital reserve fund that has agents to expend, then those agents, typically the selectmen, have the ability to spend from that capital reserve fund without going back to the voters for legislative approval. On the other hand, if there are no agents to expend, expenditures from the CRF would have to be done by a legislative body vote. So that is an extremely substantial change to the warrant article. 
We normally talk about the notice requirements as the so-called stay-at-home test. So you need to warn people sufficiently of the subject matter. So if they were interested in that subject matter, the warrant would let them know that they should come out and hear it and deliberate and discuss it. But you know, you, the idea is that if it's changed so substantially that someone would have come out if it had been warned, if it had been included on the warrant, that you are in violation of the stay-at-home rule. So that's sort of the colloquial way of saying that you need to give warrant notice. So in traditional town meetings, you know, or you may know, especially um, if you remember uh, traditional town meeting days, that voters can do a lot of different things at the town meeting. And one of those things is that they can table or pass over warrant articles entirely. So we don't like this article. We don't want to act on it. We don't want to vote yes or no. Either way, we're going to table it. No action other than that is going to be taken. You know that as an SB2 municipality, every article on the warrant is going on to the ballot. All you're doing at the deliberative session is finalizing the language that's going to show up on the ballot. So you can't pass over or table articles at the deliberative session. The voters can't move to strike them so that they don't show up on the ballot. And voters also can't, and voters have tried this, and there was a Supreme Court case uh, ruling that you can't do this. Voters have tried, well, okay, we can't pass over it, we can't delete it. What if we just take all the words after the words to see, um, delete them, and then all that shows up on the ballot are the words to see. No, that is in effect deleting or passing over um, a warrant article that has to show up on the ballot. Um, with regard to the requirement that voters can amend but can't eliminate the subject matter, that's the standard. So when we talk about, well, what's the big difference between traditional and, um, and, and SB2, what you see in RSA 40, Section 13, is that the voters can't eliminate the subject matter of the article although they can freely amend dollar amounts just like in a traditional town meeting. Just by way of sort of an example, there was a superior court case this year, this year, in, in 2016, I believe, where the voters in an SB2 municipality had amended this Warren article. The article, I believe, was a petitioned article, and the article's content, its original content, was to take the police chief and the welfare officer positions to make them elected and then to give them a set salary. That was the way the petitioned article looked when it went on the warrant. At the SB2 deliberative session, the voters substantially amended it. They amended it to say that this is an advisory article that the voters would like to continue to have these positions be appointed. And any reference to the annual salaries of these officials was struck out of the article entirely. A voter who was displeased with this result brought a lawsuit against the town. And the court said that this kind of amendment was okay. Mm -hmm. The original intent of the warrant article was preserved. It was about the police chief and the welfare officer and their positions in the municipality and the status of their positions. And even though there was a substantial change, it was still okay. The amendment was still valid. So that kind of gives you an idea that yes, there are restrictions, but for at least for the purposes of eliminating the subject matter, as long as the basic intent is preserved by the amendment, mm -hmm. the amendment is probably okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have heard no means no. I'm sure you have heard no spending without an appropriation. That is key concept number four. Again, as Steve said, an appropriation is a legislative body action. They appropriate money. They say, yes, we're going to set this money aside to spend for a particular purpose. And the idea here is that you can't spend or the, the, the governing body can't spend unless that amount was appropriated for that purpose. So I think that's a pretty basic concept, but I don't think it can ever be said enough that if you don't have a proper appropriation, you're not going to be able to spend for that purpose. And proper appropriation, that goes back in time to what Steve was talking about, starting with the procedural requirements, yeah. with the notice, with the discuss or disclose at a budget hearing. All of that is part of having a procedurally proper appropriation. 
There are exceptions, of course, as there are exceptions to every rule, the no means no rule has exceptions. Of course, transfer authority still exists um, in the governing body under 32 section 10, although they can't transfer to a purpose that doesn't exist or that has been deleted properly um, or you know zeroed out, which is the equivalent of deleted. I'm just going to say for a moment that when we're thinking about transfer authority and again, I've already said that you know the voters and the budget committee can't restrict the selectmen's transfer authority. Um, a zeroed out purpose that would prohibit transfer. We are talking about a zeroed out or deleted purpose on the posted DRA budget form. So the legislative body would have to zero out, for example, police on the municipal budget form in order to say that this is a purpose for which no money can be spent. Sometimes there's confusion, sometimes voters think there's an ability to sort of go into the weeds and delete purposes that are represented on the so-called municipal chart of accounts, which is normally a very detailed form that each municipality has in order to help track expenditures and in order to properly calculate the budget that goes on to the municipal budget form. But we're talking about what I like to call the big line items, which are the line items that show up on the DRA form. <clears throat> Other exceptions, legal judgments, if there's a legal judgment against the town, the town can't say we didn't appropriate money, we can't pay that legal judgment, they have to pay it. Um, there is, DR, you can get DRA permission to overspend the bottom line or add an appropriation, but that's with DRA permission. Um, and there are other sort of prior mandates that you can't get out of, uh, federal or state requirements, the classic example being welfare, um, which a town is required to provide even if the welfare budget has run out. So that is a requirement. Other exceptions, you are a March town meeting mm -hmm. in towns um, with the March town meeting in the January to December fiscal year. Obviously, there is a gap in time between the beginning of the year and the town meeting at which appropriations are made. And what the statute says, and this is 32 section 13 paragraph 2, is that the governing body can spend for that time period prior to the town meeting making its appropriations they can spend because obviously they have to be able to and those expenditures would be have to be reasonable in light of the prior year's approved appropriations and purposes so you're trying to mimic last year's sort of for that status quo period prior to the town meeting in march where the appropriations are made even more exceptions unanticipated revenue under rsa 31 section 95-b if the legislative body has given approval under this statute to the governing body to accept unanticipated revenue, the governing body has the ability to do that. There are some requirements such as for unanticipated revenue of $10,000 or more, there has to be um, a public hearing and acceptance of unanticipated revenue can't require the expenditure of additional funds unless those additional funds were appropriated um, as a way of accepting the grant. Capital reserve and trust funds with agents to expend. So trust funds where the legislative body has said, yes, selectmen, you are the agents to expend. You can expend from that trust fund during the year without further legislative approval. They can spend for that purpose, consistent with why the fund was created. Other funds like the conservation fund, heritage fund, um, revolving funds, water and sewer revolving funds, those are funds that have particular entities that have the ability to spend money from those funds consistent with the purpose for which the fund exists. Um, so if there is a situation where um, they're the sort of the selectmen are out of money for a particular purpose, of course they have transfer authority. So they're looking in the budget to find places where they can transfer money to the purpose that they need it for. Um, we've already talked about anticip unanticipated funds and the acceptance authority, DRA permission to overspend, and then sort of as a, a very sort of last result, I think special meetings. Because keep in mind that a special meeting where money is going to be appropriated, you have to have prior court approval, all right? So it's a big deal in order to have a special meeting. Just a couple words here on multi-year agreements. 
There are sort of different types of multi-year agreements. Collective bargaining is sort of the classic example. You have costs over a period of years based on a contract that's been agreed to. And even though the contract may have been agreed to, the cost items are still subject to legislative body approval because the legislative body appropriates money. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it works with collective bargaining agreements is that the cost items, the expense that is associated with this multi-year collective bargaining agreement goes to the voters for approval. All right, and so the voters appropriate it, the voters say yes, and what, what happens is the total cost items for the life of the collective bargaining agreement have to be disclosed up front to the voters during that, during that fiscal year at that town meeting. And if the voters have that disclosure and they say yes, and they say yes to that article and they adopt those cost items, they, that is a way that one town meeting sort of binds into the future. It's a way of binding to a multi-year contract, and it is authorized. And in fact, it goes beyond collective bargaining agreements because it can happen with other multi-year agreements that the governing body wants to enter into. And they can do that, but it's the same idea, that the full cost of that multi-year contract must be adequately disclosed to the legislative body <coughs> and adopted by the legislative body in order for the legislative body to bind going forward. Because mm -hmm. remember, the idea is that appropriations lapse at the end of the year. So if you want the legislative body to approve multiple years of appropriations for a contract, they're going to have to have those cost items for the whole life of the contract disclosed and say yes to those cost items for the full life of the contract. Multi-year equipment leases, there are some special year, uh, rules with multi-year equipment leases. Obviously, equipment leases are an important part of any municipality. If there is a so-called escape clause in the multi-year lease agreement, that it's a simple majority because the voters are actually adopting the amount for each year of the multi-year lease at each town meeting. So they do it each year, and the escape clause allows the governing body to get out of the contract if the voters don't appropriate it in any given year. So if it's a five-year lease and the voters, and it has an escape clause, and the voters say yes the first three years, and they say no the fourth year, um, there's no appropriation, they can't spend for that purpose, the governing body can use the escape clause to get out of the multi-year lease. If there's no escape clause, which means they can't get out of it, um, then it's considered um, um, long-term debt under 33 section 7e and there are some different rules for it and this term Sanborn eyes that you see that we have up on the slide here that comes from a case um, the, out of Sanborn, Sanborn um, school district Sanborn yeah. school district and sort of that's where the term came from yeah. was how do, how are collective bargaining agreements properly adopted and we now say that we have to Sanbornize them which simply means adequately disclose the cost items mm -hmm. for the life of the contract and it applies to all multi-year contracts not just collective bargaining Bargaining agreements. Key concept number five, which I just referenced, is the idea that appropriations lapse at the end of the fiscal year. They are good for the year, mm -hmm. and then they lapse. The unspent money, if any, goes into the fund balance. It is not free money to do anything with. It's not leftover money to go shopping with. It has to be appropriated again by the voters. That's one thing that can happen to it. It's, it's in there, and it can be appropriated for expenditures at the next town meeting. It can be used to reduce the following year's tax rate, mm -hmm. um, or it can be retained for emergencies. Um, and sometimes retaining um, a certain amount of the fund balance is a good idea. And in fact, as you'll see on the next slide, the recommendation is 5 to 15 yeah. percent of regular general fund operating revenues or 8 to 17 percent of regular general fund operating expenditures is a safe percentage to retain in the general fund. The fund balance, and this is just to give you a general idea, and often Barbara speaks to this because she's so good at all of this <laughs> stuff, but the fund balance is the net amount of the unexpended appropriations, excess revenues received, uncollected taxes, and other liabilities. That is what you are thinking about when someone uses the term fund balance. That is what it is. There are, again, exceptions to the lapse rule. So the general rule is appropriations lapse at the end of the year. But that's not the end of the sentence. 
one of Steve mentioned special versus um, separate warrant articles. One really important exception to the lapse rule are special warrant articles. And there are sort of two ways that special warrant articles don't have to lapse necessarily at the end of the fiscal year. Any special warrant article, so these are bonds, these are petitioned articles, um, these are articles funding capital reserve funds, and these are any other articles designated simply as special, non-lapsing, um, right. things of that nature. Any special warrant article can be encumbered for one additional year by the governing body prior to the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. They have a special warrant article adopted in, in March of 2016. Prior to the end of tw 2016 fiscal year, the governing body can encumber one one more year. Yeah. Another way that special warrant articles get encumbered mm -hmm. is if the special warrant article itself, when adopted, said this is a special warrant article, it's non-lapsing, and it's not going to lapse for X amount of years. Mm -hmm. That amount of years can be up to five. That's yeah. the maximum. So you could have language in the initial warrant article that said it's non-lapsing for up to three years, four years, five years, and that would be another way to prevent laps. Um, another way to um, to prevent laps is encumbering funds by contract, so entering into a truly enforceable contract before the end of the fiscal year to encumber funds to be spent for the purpose of that contract mm -hmm. is another way. Bonds are do not lapse anticipated grants. Grants last for the lifetime of whatever the grant says the money is available for. Capital reserve funds, again, you're saving up money. Those continue on and on throughout the years. Same thing with trust funds, special revenue funds and revolving funds, which we'll hopefully have time to speak on a little bit, or I, but I do see that I have approximately 11 minutes. Um, laps, more on the lapse of appropriation, other non-lapsing funds. These are other types of funds that the money doesn't lapse at the end of the year. And the language you usually see on the statute is that the funds accrue from year to year, which means do not lapse. Conservation funds, sewer, water, impact fees collected, and also recreation revolving funds under 35B. And the other thing you also will commonly see with regards to some of these funds is it also is made clear these funds, such as the water fund, the sewer fund, it's not part of the general fund of the town. They're always considered as separate funds and designated as such in the statute that creates them. Absolutely. Um, We've already talked quite a bit about transfer of appropriations. The only thing that I don't think we've talked about is that transfer cannot be out of special warrant articles. So there are sort of two special things about special warrant articles. One is the avoidance of lapse for a period of time, and the other is that the selectman can't transfer money out of a special warrant article to be spent on another purpose. But we've really already gone over most of these concepts. This case that's referenced up here, <laughs> Sullivan versus, uh, and I know versus that Hampton, <laughs> um, it affirms the governing body's unfettered authority to transfer, and it applies to both the operating budget or the default budget. Sometimes we do get questions uh, with yeah. confusion about transfer in the default <laughs> budget. Default budget is still the op an operating budget. It's just that the one proposed didn't pass, so we have the default budget. But all of the authority with regard to transfer remains even in a default budget year. <laughs> Um, just a word, and I, I think I've talked a little bit about no means no and deleting of purposes. The no means no rule really uh, was meant to apply to separate articles. So you have an article set out separately from the operating budget mm -hmm. to appropriate money for a particular purpose, and the voters say, no thanks. They don't adopt it. No means no really means no spending for the purpose right. stated in that separate article that the voters said no to. That's the way it works. And that can be, you know, sort of a, a consideration when putting appropriations into separate articles is that, yes, it's great if the voters adopt it, but it's, it cannot be so great if the voters say no because it restricts the ability to spend from the operating budget from that purpose, you know? So it's a big restriction and it's, a, it's an important restriction. <laughs> And as I've already said, when we're talking about deleting or zeroing out purposes, aside from separate articles, which are much sort of clearer to conceptualize when those have been zeroed out or those have been deleted um, or not adopted, also separate line items in the DRA budget could technically be zeroed out or deleted, but it would truly have to be the big line items in um, the operating budget, which would be a horrible thing to have happen. 
this is we just use sort of this figure or this picture here to to give you an idea of the budget cycle. Obviously, it's it's a it's sort of a constant cycle because you know there's preparation of the budget in the fall that sort of that around that time frame. There's adoption of the budget in March, and then there's just sort of uh, you know monitoring of expenditures and getting ready to again propose another budget in the fall. Um, and so being aware of the expenditures that are going on and being aware of how the budget is working out is part of the budget committee's role as well. Um, and so this just gives you an idea that that is sort of how the cycle, cycle of life in the budget world works. I only have a few more minutes here, so I'm going to go over um, just a couple fun sources, and I won't go into depth on municipal bonds. There's <coughs> several slides on municipal bonds, and I don't think that we need to go super in depth on those, probably not your most pressing issue. But just to keep in mind, there are a lot of other fund sources um, other than general taxation other ways um, to fund appropriations, reserve funds, saving, which are savings accounts, um, entering into lease agreements, bonds or notes. User fees is another way to, um, to get income for, to use for appropriations, special revenue or revolving funds, grants, unanticipated revenue, state aid if that exists, general fund balance, and property taxes. Really important, I think, just to touch upon reserve funds and the fact that the so, sort of so-called trust fund, which you can you might hear municipal trust fund or town funded trust fund, and then you'll also hear people use use the term capital <coughs> reserve fund. They're really the same concept. You know, they're both savings for expenditure on a particular purpose. They're funds that don't lapse. Both of them can have agents to expend or not which means that if there's going to be an expenditure from the fund, the town meeting, the legislative body has to appropriate money. But an expendable trust fund is technically governed by 31, section 19A, um, some kind of fund established for a specific public purpose, so any proper public purpose that an appropriation can be made for, although we're usually thinking maintenance and operations type activities, Capital reserve funds, same concept, except they are limited to the specific public purpose listed in 35 section one, and you're talking about capital items, improvement, acquisition, equipment, land, things of that nature, all right? But they both play by the same rules, um, expendable trust funds and capital reserve funds. There are specific rules for establishing the funds. There are specific rules if you want to change the purpose of a fund, one of those rules being it would require a two-thirds vote for a legislative body to change purpose from A to B of an already existing capital reserve fund, and then dissolving funds. There's no ability to transfer money among capital reserve funds or trust right. funds. You can't just tra appropriate from one fund into another, um, but you can change the purpose. You can discontinue capital reserve funds and appropriate money from a discontinued <coughs> capital reserve fund to a new purpose or into a new capital reserve fund. Expendable trust funds can be used to mitigate operating costs, and that's sort of the idea here. Um, one of the examples that Steve gives often is the health insurance increase, having um, an expendable trust fund that sort of has money for, for sort of taking care of situations where there are health insurance increase or pension costs and sort of having that money available to offset operating budget costs by having that ETF. Lease agreements. I think I've already talked about this. Um, but lease agreements with a non-appropriation clause, the escape clause, um, they can be uh, terminated annually in the event that there's no appropriation. They're not debt. They require a majority vote. Sort of the key here on this slide is that a capital reserve fund cannot be used to fund a lease agreement that has an escape clause except for the final payment. That is what the statute says. Lease agreements without an escape clause, they do constitute long-term debt. They need, um, and they have to be adopted using that super majority vote requirement that you find in RSA Chapter 33. And capital reserve fund money can be used for multiple payments 
on a lease agreement without an escape clause. Again, those are listed right in the statute, and um, those are sort of important for um, you know the selectmen, but also you to keep in mind because when you're budgeting, you need to know what the capital reserve fund can be used for and what it can't be. So I'm just going to skip through municipal bonds here because I want to just touch briefly here on user fees um, and then special revenue versus revolving funds and then we will end for um, this presentation. So user fees are obviously an excellent way of generating money for a particular purpose. Um, you know, they can be for a specific service, they benefit a specific segment of the population or for a public service. Service, they benefit the general public. Um, you know, everyone benefits. No one can opt out. So when you have user fees for things that only certain people use, they're the ones paying the user fee. If it applies to everyone equally, then there's no way to sort of avoid the uh, the user fee. And I think what we have here is just um, a somewhat ill-conceived image here of the spectrum of um, you know the water sewer kind of user fee being a specific one um, for those people using the water sewer, and then police fire is something that everyone is responsible for and applies equally to everyone. In deciding whether you have the ability to charge a user fee for something, it sort of just goes back to the concept of no home rule and we need to look for authority to act in this area before we can either appropriate or have a user fee for it. Um, is there statutory authority for the fee? Well, we have, and, and I spent more time than I care to share with you, putting together a chart in the basic law of budgeting, I believe of all or most of the statutes that authorize user fees, um, permit fees, license charges, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So we have a chart in one of the appendices here, and it's a great starting point for going in and saying, is there an ability to charge a fee for this particular purpose? And there were way more than I even realized there would be once I was done with the <laughs> appendix. Um, you know, making a determination of what's the appropriate level um, of cost for the fee, um, the cost for the service is obviously something that has to be taken into consideration. And then and there's also the 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 thought of where the money's going to go because what these are sort of the two classic places that you put um, fees being the special revenue fund or a revolving fund mm -hmm. really important to just know the basic difference between the two you know the, the money goes into both of them but a special revenue fund the legislative body votes to restrict revenue or a portion of revenue from a specific purpose mm -hmm. to expenditures for a specific purpose, so that sounds like revolving fund, but it's really important that it, you need an appropriation from the legislative body every time you want to spend from a special revenue fund. <coughs> On the other hand, when the legislative body creates a revolving fund, it again is limited to a particular activity, but what happens is the money from the activity goes into the fund, and then the money from the fund comes out of the fund to pay for the activity. Yeah. And that is why it's called a revolving fund. It's supposed to be a self-sustaining fund, getting fees from an activity, spending fees for an activity. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, there's no legislative body uh, approval needed once the revolving fund is established. The money goes in, the money comes out in order to fund that particular purpose. I've already talked about all of these requirements up here on the screen with regard to grants. And in fact, we have even talked about uh, general fund balance and the lapse at the end of the year, as well as what makes up the general fund balance and the guidance for how much to retain 